come from Lebanon. I was born and raised in Lebanon, which used to be the only majority Christian country in the Middle East. We were open-minded, we were fair, we were tolerant, we were multicultural. We prided ourselves on our multiculturalism. We had open border policy, we welcomed everyone to come to our country because we wanted to share with them the westernization which we had created in the heart of the Arabic world. Muslims used to send their children to study in our universities because we had built the best universities in the Arabic world. They graduated and worked in our economy because we had built the best economy in the Middle East, even though we did not have any oil. Beirut became Paris of the Middle East, the banking capital of the Middle East. In 1965, National Geographic magazine had on its front cover, Lebanon, Eden of the Middle East. Unfortunately, all this began to change as the years went by. See, we got our independence in the early 40s. But by the 60s and 70s, the Christians had become the minority and the Muslims had become the majority in Lebanon. And as the Islamic um, population grew in the country, the country became less and less tolerant because they started pushing for more rights that were not compatible with our, with our Judeo-Christian value system that we had created. And that's when the problems started. The problem was contained until the influx of the Palestinians out of Jordan in 1970, when Lebanon brought them in because we already had refugee camps. Actually, at that time, Lebanon was the only country in the Middle East to accept the third wave of Palestinians into Lebanon. The majority of them were Muslims. They put their heads together with the Muslims in Lebanon and declared jihad on the Christians. What they wanted to do is create a base from which to fight Israel, kill the Jews, and throw them into the sea. Something they tried to do in Jordan. Yes, Arafat and the Palestinians tried to do in Jordan, but they failed because of the dictatorship of the king. Yet they were able to come to Lebanon, use our open-mindedness, our fairness, our tolerance, our multiculturalism, and our democracy to topple our democracy. My 9-11 happened to me in 1975, when, that, when radical Muslims blew up my home, bringing it down, burying me under the rubble wounded, as they shouted, Allahu Akbar. My only crime was that I was a Christian living in a Christian town. I ended up in a hospital for two and a half months. And as I laid in a hospital bed, hooked up to IVs in both arms, I would ask my parents, why did they do this to us? Why did they attack us? And my father would tell me, because we are Christians, the Muslims consider us infidels and they want to kill us. So I knew since I was a 10-year-old child that I am wanted dead simply because I was born into the Christian faith and lived in a Christian town. This is something so foreign to Christians in America. Because in America, our idea of persecution is, oh, I took my Bible with me to work today and people looked at me funny. <laughs> That's our idea of persecution. Where I come from, our idea of persecution is they want to walk into this church and start shooting at you and killing you. Just like what they're doing in Iraq right now. Just like what they're doing in Egypt right now. Just like what they're doing in Syria. Just like what they did in Lebanon. Actually, what launched the all-out war in Lebanon was four Muslims walked into a church service on a Sunday morning just like this and started shooting at people. That's what started the Lebanese civil war. So that's where England's at. We now have all of these towns and major cities that are completely taken over by a densely packed Muslim population who control housing. We have a Muslim housing association in London, so we cannot access that housing. There's a Muslim police association in London. It's not one like you have, you have the pretend Muslim police, don't you? You have the pretend NYPD cars. Ours is real, the Muslim police association. And before you know it, you have this dual policing system that starts off, and that's not a good thing to witness. So I'll give you one example. In a place called Glasgow, it is a rough end of uh, Glasgow. There's a densely packed Muslim population. It's the middle of the day, four o'clock. And out onto the street comes a woman. She's all aflame. She's all lit up. And she's screaming, help me. Help me. And the guy hears her and he runs out. He's in a garage where he's working. He manages to find water. She's on the grass now, laid down. 
and he manages to throw water on her and puts her out. And I have pictures still of the grass where they picked her up and put her in the ambulance, all black and burnt. That part of Glasgow is under Sharia. It's under Muslim policing. Um, they did a statement. Um, the police said there were no suspicious circumstances. And the local mosque, despite the fact there was no other comment to be made by the police, the mosque said, it was one of our sisters. It was not a hate crime, so people don't need to be concerned. But a good Muslim doesn't gossip about what happens to a sister. Now, when you start with that kind of policing happening, then all of your faith in your country is very easily diluted. The reason 2,000 of our young white girls were raped in one town alone, Rotherham, was because when the girls went to the police, the police didn't want to be called Islamophobic. When the girls told the social workers, they didn't want to be called racist. The girls were t pushed away, turned away. No, you must be wrong. Some of them were from care homes, so they just weren't believed. And in the end, 2,000 girls were raped by gangs of majority Pakistani Muslim men. I was uh, referred to the police. I was uh, investigated for calling these rape squads majority Pakistani Muslim rape squads. And it wasn't looking too good for me until statistics uh, came out on it and it was revealed that they were actually majority Pakistani Muslim rape squads. So I'll take that one. But this is where the police come in. The police are now a legitimate arm of the government silencing machine. There is a hate crime unit that Sadiq Khan has set up to police Twitter, specifically my Twitter. Um, and I have been arrested and interviewed under caution by the Major Crime and Homicide Command, two men in a cell with a tape recorder uh, for, a, for a column I wrote in the newspaper about migrants because it was seen as hate speech. Um, luckily, uh, that wasn't referred and I got away with that. But they, they are cracking down fast. My children are referred to social services. So people that are against me or want to shut me up or ring social services about my children. So we've had them to the house three, four times, and I respect that, I'm glad, because if someone's in trouble, I want them to be found out. The only thing I wonder is, where were social services for those 2,000 girls in Rotherham when they needed some help? Why is it that it would be believable if it was something to do with me?